Alaska is known to most as a cold, unforgiving place, but summer in Alaska is actually breathtaking and is known as harvest season to Alaskan natives, the Native Americans who make up 15% of the state's population. And I still think a lot about it, living in the village and not worrying about anything except trying to preserve and put away our foods for the winter. And This is the traditional Alaskan subsistence lifestyle, the way people have been living here for thousands of years. But with poor fishing regulations and the effects of climate change, this way of life seems to be at risk of dying off. On a piece of land north of Anchorage lives a man named Greg. Greg isn't an Alaskan native, but he's an Alaskan homesteader. He has a kind of farm where he makes log furniture and tries to live off the land. Greg loves living out there, but he's been really stressed this past year. You see, Greg makes some money through the furniture, but like I said, he tries to live off the land. He keeps bees, has chickens, grows vegetables, hunts, and harvests the salmon run. And recently, he hasn't been able to harvest that much salmon. My name is Greg Holstein. I was born in Illinois, but moved to Kenai, Alaska when I was two years old. About 31 years living in Alaska altogether. Oh yeah, just grab it by the tail here. Start right about there, slice straight down. And then just feel that backbone and go right along the backbone. Sharp knives. Alaska has several legally defined types of fishing. Ideal. There's sport fishing, just fishing for fun with a rod and reel, and then there are subsistence and commercial fishing. And commercial fishing would be pretty much always using some sort of net, typically a boat, and catching the fish out in the ocean and bringing them to a uh, processor and selling them on the market. And lift up behind this fin and cut right behind the head. Subsistence, generally, I think of it is the way people have been using salmon as a main staple in their diet for many thousands of generations up here, the native people. But uh, I would say more aimed at like the villages and more remote places where they're allowed to harvest a lot more fish. And I've definitely seen the fishery go downhill over my lifetime. And the rivers seem like they have, I mean, some years it seems like they're on and we get a good run and uh, other years everybody's looking at each other wondering where the salmon are so it's uh, kind of been hit and miss uh, especially when you see the subsistence fishermen getting shut down and not being being able to catch fish or only being able to fish for 12 hours and you see the commercial fishermen out there catching lots of fish and sending them out to the open market out of state and uh, I think that's wrong. Like Greg said, the past few years, subsistence fishermen have had shortened or closed seasons in some parts of Alaska due to troubled salmon runs in different rivers. Yet, commercial fishermen haven't. But before we start pointing any fingers, it's important to note that no one around seems to know why the salmon fisheries are acting this way. In Alaska, people talk about the salmon run like they do the weather. And everyone seems to have their own crazy story about what's going on with the fish. I've heard people cite everything from overfishing to earthquakes to leftover radiation from the Fukushima nuclear disaster. But to get some real answers, let's go a little bit south. (laughs) 
Southeast Alaska. A dense chain of islands covered in temperate rainforest and totem poles. On one of these islands, the tiny town of Sitka sits, surviving on its fishing industry. Having such a rich run, Sitka houses a number of salmon hatcheries. And then there's trolling is big around here. So all those boats you see down there that have the mast, somebody's putting their pole down right now. You can see it going down like that. Oh yeah. So those poles go down like that and then hooks are run off of those. One such hatchery is the Sitka Science Center. And so this facility is mostly education and research based. We're very small compared to a lot of the other organizations. So these are coho, or this one's coho or silver salmon. This is a pink or a humpy, obviously. And this is a chum or a dog salmon. These are three of the five types of salmon in Alaska. The other two are red salmon, or reds, and king salmon, called kings or chinook. Salmon have pretty complex life cycles. An egg will first be fertilized or hatched in a freshwater stream or hatchery. So this is just a little, this is something that we share with visitors too. This is the development. So from fertilization up to fry stage. So this is their, all their stages that would, they would go through in incubation. So it's a little between three and four months that they'll spend in incubation from the time we take their eggs. They'll then spend a few years maturing still in freshwater either in a stream or in a hatchery like this. So these fish will be released next May, and they're eggs that we took in the fall of 2016. When they're big enough, they swim out into salt water for most of their adult lives. Each summer though, huge numbers of salmon come back to the exact little creeks or fisheries they were born in to mate, lay eggs, and die. This yearly mass migration is called the salmon run, and the scale of it is so grand that it's hard to understand if you haven't seen it. Every predator in Alaska depends on the salmon run, including humans. So it's crucially important that it remains stable. Without the salmon run, life as we know it just wouldn't be possible in Alaska. So the fish that are here right now are returning because we release them here and they'll come up into these raceways. And then these crowding screens, we'll crowd them forward and use that knuckle boom to scoop them out and we'll fertilize the eggs and put them in our incubation room start the process over again. Up here the whole program was started because of a big decline in salmon and then management obviously improved and then a bunch of uh, commercial fishermen got together and started these private nonprofits. So they pay an enhancement tax and then there's more fish for them to catch. So we're research and education based but we also enhance the fishery. So we release a fair amount of salmon that get caught in commercial fisheries. Last year was a devastating pink return for most areas and most stocks. We had a great return and harvest last year for whatever reason. We were pretty much the only place <laughs> that did, yeah. Normally all of our incubators would be set up and we'd be ready to go right now. So there's incubation on one side, the other side is a nursery, and right now there's an ocean acidification. There's some research going on in there. I can take you in there if you want yeah, to see it. My name is Christy Croker. I'm an assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz. We are studying the effects of climate change and ocean acidification, going from these little creatures where we can measure the effects. So baby oysters and microscopic sea butterflies and then what that means as you start to scale up to the fish and the animals that rely on kelp forests and kelp forest critters for food. And so ocean acidification is this process where the carbon dioxide that's driving climate change is actually absorbed by the ocean, which makes the water more acidic. And in Alaska what we're seeing is that that is very pronounced during winter months because cold water can hold more carbon dioxide. We're also measure measuring the effects on um, pteropods, which are called sea butterflies, 
and they are extremely important food sources for salmon. So we can already see in California when you get these cold upwelling conditions and the water's more acidic that the pteropods, their shells start to thin and dissolve. We haven't yet been able to make the link to what does that mean for fisheries, although there's a huge amount of concern because some of the salmon fisheries, um, they think that adult life stages will eat 60% of their diet as pteropods. Though rising acidity is a problem, what it does to salmon fisheries is poorly understood right now. And it doesn't account for why some Alaskan fisheries are suffering so much while others are doing just fine. For instance, the Kuskokwim River, way up by the Bering Sea, has lost 75% of its king salmon over the past decade, while nearby pollock fisheries aren't hurting at all. Now, a ton of Alaskan natives still live a subsistence lifestyle on the Kuskokwim. We pick seaweed, kelp, we roll it in a ball. When you store that seaweed in a ball, it ages and it's got that flavor that, mm. oh, good flavor. Wild-caught king salmon in particular makes up about half of the protein they consume each year. With the king run having been so bad, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game put new regulations in on the Kuskokwim that limited the subsistence season from its previous one month to just 12 hours in 2017. That's 12 hours to catch half of their protein for the entire year, and on some parts of the river, the season's been gotten rid of completely. We gathered our uh, salmon up the rivers, got what we needed for the winter to put in our drying shed or in the smokehouse. We really never had to have a uh, license. We'd go up there and get what we need. But there is game wardens, we call, that come around now and watch for people that some people get ticketed. So now, on top of there being less fish in the water, the natives have to risk being arrested to illegally catch the fish that's still there. Of native people that have low income and don't have a job, they have to gather their resources for the winter. It's not like we can, you know, have the money to go to a grocery store and, and buy half a beef or whatever. It just goes, it's just a day by day thing. And out on the Kuskokwim, there are actually some really clear, crazy correlations between commercial fishing practices and drops in king salmon populations. Like I said, the Kuskokwim runs into the Bering Sea, so any salmon born in the Kuskokwim move out to the Bering Sea as adults. Of course, king salmon aren't the only things fished for in the Bering Sea. There's also the tremendous and destructive commercial Alaskan pollock industry. Now, Alaskan pollock is... Well, it's fast food. Burger King, McDonald's, Arby's, Chick-fil-A, Wendy's, pretty much any fast food fish sandwich is made of Alaskan Pollock, aka North Pacific Cod. Dave, didn't catch anything, huh? Not today. It's a good thing we make a delicious fish sandwich here at Wendy's. With that said, commercial Pollock fishing boats on the Bering Sea aren't little family-owned vessels. They're these tremendous floating factories with full fish processing facilities on board. They do the whole process from catching the fish to boxing it. These giant boats are called big net trawling boats, and how they work is that they put a big old net into the water, aim it at a school of pollock, and scoop it up. With a net that big though, you're always going to catch more than what you're aiming for. When pollock trawling boats bring in their nets, they'll normally catch some king salmon accidentally. This kind of unintended catch is called bycatch, and it's an inherent part of big net trawling. Unfortunately, because these boats don't have permits for salmon, they legally aren't allowed to keep them, and are forced to throw them overboard, even though they're usually already dead. If king salmon bycatch is high for just one year, it isn't good, but it isn't that big of a deal in the long run. But if king salmon bycatch is high for five years in a row, it becomes a really big problem. If you remember, salmon live in life cycles of about five years, in which they're born in freshwater, live in saltwater as adults, then go back to freshwater to lay eggs and die. 
So if five years pass of a whole lot of salmon dying before they can get back to fresh water and have kids, then that's an entire salmon lifetime, several generations of salmon not really having kids. And when summer comes, well, you can have a whale of a lot of fun going swimming, as these people are doing at Anchorage. It would be like if only a fraction of people lived long enough to have kids for 50 or so years. The population decline would be exponential, so it would take the population an absurd amount of time to recover, if it could recover at all. A challenge to make new homes and live better lives. And that's exactly what happened on the Kuskokwim. Salmon are being caught here in fish wheels, which scoop them up out of the Kuskokwim River. This keeps mother very busy, cleaning and washing each salmon. In 2007, 125,000 king salmon were bycaught by Pollock trawling boats in the Bering Sea, about four times more than in the early 90s. That's between 2.5 million and 7.5 million pounds of king salmon caught, killed, and thrown overboard in a single fishing season. Five years later, the subsistence harvest on the entire Kuskokwim River was only 25,000 kings. Eskimo mothers have been doing this year after year for centuries. That's 50% less than the year before and 75% less than five years earlier in 2007. By 2014, that number was down to a meager 15,500, only about one quarter of the amount of king salmon that the Alaska Department of Fish and Game deems reasonably necessary for subsistence uses. That means by the government's standards, living a subsistence lifestyle in the Kuskokwim is just impossible right now. There's simply not enough king salmon. Last summer, natives on the Kuskokwim pretty much couldn't eat the king salmon that runs through their own land. That has been part of their culture for a millennia. That would now get them arrested. Yet, at the very same time, you had the constant option to go to McDonald's and buy a filet fish sandwich for a dollar. McDonald's made billions off of Alaskan pollock, and the commercial pollock industry never really took a hit. Who's responsible for fixing this? Fast food? Fishing giants? The EPA? Or the people who put demand on this industry? Well, I'll leave that up to you.